It's so good to be together. I want to welcome all of our campuses, all of our extensions, those of you who are joining us internationally. I'm so excited in the month of October to get to visit both our Santa Rosa and our Hong Kong campus. And Stacy and I can't wait to be with you. Now, today we are kicking off a brand new message series. It's called The Lost Art of Friendship. And I was reading an article this last week. It was written by a guy named David Brooks. And it was a fascinating article because in the article, he talked about this longitudinal study of children, small children, six, seven, eight years old, uh, who were born into neighborhoods of poverty. And they took this small group of students or kids And they studied them over a decade, two decades, and they put them in two different groups. And one group of people, one group of kids, was put into a group uh, with people beyond or in different socioeconomic classes. So these kids were in poverty, connected to people outside their socioeconomic class. And then there was another group of kids that were basically, they, they stayed in the same socioeconomic group. And what they noticed is over the course of time, those kids that were connected to people that were in different places in society, that they began to break out of that poverty that their family was in. And so much of it was connected to the relationships and the doors that opened and the mindsets that changed and some of them started going to schools and it it was a radical shift because they were connected to a different group of people. Now, we all know that to be true, right? Like, we are often the sum total of the five closest friends in our lives. The people that we spend the most time with impact us deeply. And studies show us that when it comes to friendship, when we're in friendship with one another in meaningful quality relationships, it leads to a longer life, it leads to a happier life, it leads to lower stress, it leads to greater fulfillment. It is inside of us, in friendship, there's this longing for community because when we experience life that way, it's the way that God intended for life to be and life is way better when we're in community. But at the same time, on the other end of the the, the coin, we all know that friendship and relationships is often so incredibly hard, so painful, so difficult. And sometimes in the proximity around us with family or neighbors or the people that we're closest to. There's a lot of pain and strife and brokenness that we experience in our relationships. And if we look at our world right now, actually what we see is a diminishing in the quality of relationships. We see actually more people now lonely and isolated than any time in modern history. In fact, another study that I looked at this week shows us that people, when it comes to the number of confidants or close, trustworthy friends, compared to 20 years ago, we have half the number of people who have one friend. And actually, most of us, statistically, would say that we don't have one person that we can rely on at a deep level. Now, that's problematic. That we're made and designed for friendship, we long for community, yet sometimes it's so hard And deep within our soul, there is this ache and this longing that even in the difficulty, we still want friendship. In every culture, we still search for it and long for it. In Southeast Asia and in South America at our campus there and in in, uh, Berlin and Europe and all of our locations all over the world, there is this sense in which we are made for community and we want it, but it's hard. And the reason that we can't let go of it, this is so important. The reason that we don't let go of it is because friendship comes from God. It is inherently built into our DNA as humans. That when a baby is born, the first place that a baby looks is at their mother's face. There is this longing inside of us for connection. It is from God And it is in his design for our lives to be in community. In Genesis chapter 2, God made humanity. And this verse has probably been read a hundred times in sermons. And you've heard it before, perhaps. But it is still very, very important that when God made humanity and he looked out after making all of creation, he had just made Adam. And he looked at Adam and he said, it is not good for man to be alone. And I think I should get an amen at that point for some, from some men. It is not good. Maybe a wife would say, it's not good for a man to be alone because they make problems. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right 
for him. So God designed us from the beginning for friendship. But in our fallen world, in the brokenness of our relationships, there's so much pain and friendship is so hard. And in our culture now, it's so much more difficult. Like, if you look back over the course of your last week, and you think about how many times you were with people that you're supposed to be connecting with, and your face is staring at a device, or you think about so many people around you that perhaps in their life, it seems like their relationships are amazing, and they post these pictures online where everybody in their family is wearing the same color outfit, and all their kids are smiling, and your kids are fist fighting before you take a picture. It's never happened in my family, but I'm sure it does in yours. And, and you look and you're like, it's something is, it's not right, it's not the way it's supposed to be. And what I wanna propose to you throughout the course of this series is God has made us for friendship, and friendship or relationship is not only inherent in our design as humans, but it is built in to who God is. That God has existed as a triune God for all eternity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have been in this great dance of friendship and community for all eternity. And his longing, God's longing, is to bring us in to that kind of friendship. And so what I want to do today is I want to begin with looking at the model for friendship. That when Jesus would come, he would be the perfect, truest friend. He would be the friend and model for us friendship in, a, in the kind of way that all of us could look and see the example. And I want us to look at how Jesus intentionally formed friendships with people in a way that might perhaps encourage us with a model that we could look at. Because if I'm honest, it's hard for me when it comes to models. Because there are some people I look at with friendships, in my opinion, they got way too many friends. And then there are other people I look at and they're like, they have no friends. And it's hard to find the model. Well, Jesus is the perfect model for us of friendship. And I want us to begin by looking how John describes Jesus. He says, the word, Jesus, became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So when Jesus would come, he would come in the fullness of the glory of the Father. He would take on human skin. The Father would send the Son to planet Earth and God would become one of us. So God wrote himself into the story and he wrote himself into the story not to start a religion. Jesus wrote himself into the story to invite us into community with the triune God for friendship. At the core of Jesus coming to planet Earth was for friendship. It was so that we would know and experience his heart. And Jesus, at the end of his ministry, is looking with this small group of people often known as his disciples, and he would look at them after training them as a, as a teacher or a rabbi. At the end of his ministry, he would say to these 12 disciples of his, he says, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves, but now you are my friends. Could you imagine what that would have been like to be with Jesus as he looks at these, these men and women and he says, now we're, we're friends. You've become one of my friends. And since I've told you everything the Father told me, you're my friend. And notice this line, you did not choose me, I chose you. If you're taking notes, I wanna encourage you, underline or highlight in your digital notes, just highlight that phrase that says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Because Jesus is saying every relationship, every friendship that God has with anyone is always initiated by God. He's always the one that took the first step. Psalm 23 verse six says that your goodness and mercy has been following me, chasing after me my entire life. And this truth Jesus is saying, I chose you guys to be my friends. And he says, now I'm appointing you to go produce lasting fruit. So the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, this is the focus of the life of a Jesus follower. It's to love each other. And the first component I want us to see of Jesus modeling is intentionality. That Jesus modeled for us how to be intentional in friendship, how to be intentional in relationship. 
And the way that Jesus modeled this kind of intentionality is by him taking the first step towards us, that he would leave the glory and comfort of heaven. He would take on human skin to be in friendship with us. He was intentional to build relationship, to build community so that we could know the heart of God. And the invitation for those who follow Jesus is to become the kind of people that are intentional wherever we go, that we're intentional in marriage, in our relationships, and we're intentional with our children as we're raising them. And for those who are students, we're, we're forming friendships in a way that we're intentional. And the opposite of intentionality is just basically to slowly drift into nothingness, to drift into no connection, no relationship. And there's this pull away from community because of technology, because of the brokenness in our world, but intentionality is simply bringing back to center in proximity that I have to other people to be more intentional with those that I'm in proximity to. Now, let me explain it like this. Um, I had a friend who went on a boat to a place called Catalina Island, and those who are in Southern California know this place, but for our interna international audience, there's an island about 22 miles off the coast of California called Catalina Island. And my friend was saying that when he got off of the boat, he looked at the small radar, and there was a little squiggly line that showed how the boat had traveled to Catalina Island. And what he thought was so fascinating was the line was actually not a straight line from the coast to Catalina Island, it was a line like this. And he looked at the person who was like leading the trip and was like, well, did, did you take us on a detour? And the person who was driving the boat said, no, actually, the boat is constantly course correcting. And you might not feel it, but it's constantly coming back to the destination. That's why we ended up at Catalina Island, not in the middle of nowhere between here and Hawaii, because we course corrected along the way. Statistics show us, actually, if you got in an airplane and left New York City, and came to LA, if you were one degree off, you would end up 40 miles outside of LA, and when you land your airplane, you would land in the ocean. So one degree makes a huge difference. And intentionality is simply in the community, the relationships that I'm in, is being more intentional. So the way I think of this, and the way it's fleshing up for me is, when I'm driving down the road with my kids, it's hard with teenage boys to get more than a sentence out of them, but man, I'll ask a question. They can make any open-ended question a one-word response. It's unbelievable. And I'm trying, I'm trying to ask them intentional questions to, to get into their hearts, to try to understand how their day was. Even in, in marriage or my relationship with Stacy is just when we're together, asking better, more intentional questions. One of the best ways to be intentional is to take a step towards that person, asking questions, getting into their world, understanding what's going on in the inside of their hearts. And Jesus so beautifully modeled that with his disciples. He was so incredibly intentional to form community. When he spent his 33 years here on planet Earth, it was all about people. Everything that Jesus did was about relationships and friendships that he was forming, and it began with his intentionality. Now, intentionality does something for us. It increases our awareness. So I've been here 14 months at Saddleback, and uh, I noticed after about 10 months of stepping on the scale, there was this slow drift. And I called it my Saddleback 17. So. And the first year I put on 17 pounds. So I hired a nutritionist to help me. Somebody came to me after the service and says, what's the name of your nutritionist? And um, I'll share it with you later if you want to know it. But he's been super helpful. And uh, he said to me, Andy, uh, what I'm going to have you do is you're going to have to write down everything that you eat. Like everything you bite. If you bite it, you write it. So I got this app on my phone. And everything, this is not to make, I feel like I'm making people feel guilty right now. It's so quiet at Lake Forest. So quiet. I don't know about the campuses. No guilt, no pressure. This is an illustration, okay? Um, but I started, I started writing down everything. And what I noticed was 
every time I had to write it down, my awareness increased. So that intentionality, what it did, what it helped me realize, okay, everything I put into my mouth is a calorie. Everything that I bite is impacting my body. Intentionality increases the awareness. Now, Jesus was incredibly intentional, but he was also aware of the people around him. And he would often ask them really intriguing questions. Like one time, Jesus was, he was starting to form this community of disciples. And John the Baptist, who started before Jesus, had this group of disciples that were following him. And this group of disciples that were following John the Baptist noticed Jesus, and they actually went from John the Baptist to Jesus. And John the Baptist makes this beautiful statement. He said, you know, I'm, I'm just here as one who's preparing the way. I'm, I'm not the one that's being celebrated. This is not my wedding. I'm here to celebrate the bridegroom. I'm, I'm just a friend at the bridegroom's wedding. So I'm, I'm not here. It's all about Jesus. So he's pointing to Jesus. But when John's disciples or followers start to follow Jesus, Jesus does something that's almost comical. So they walk up to Jesus and they start following him. And Jesus looks at them and says, um, the, the following day, John, and this is John chapter one, John was again standing with two of his disciples and Jesus walked by and John looked at him and declared, look, there is the Lamb of God. And when John's two disciples heard this, they, they left and they followed Jesus. This would be like if I brought a guest preacher to Saddleback and when they came, you all went to that person's church afterwards. Like, that's what's happening with Jesus. And John's like, that's great, it's all about Jesus. So they start following Jesus and Jesus looks around at them and says this, what do you want? Now I don't know what tone it was in, I wish I could see his face, but there's something so profound about the question that Jesus is asking is, why are, why are you following me? What are you looking for? What do you want? He asks this question. And he asked them, and they replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon, and they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him for the rest of the day. Now, Jesus was helping these disciples, these men, tap into what was on the inside. He was assessing their desire, their desire to follow him or to be in friendship with him. So when it comes to forming friendship, Jesus was a master of being aware of desires. He formed friendship through awareness of what was happening in people. He could recognize this is what this person is looking for. And he did it explicitly by asking, what do you want? What do you desire? Intentionality increases my desire. And all of us are surrounded by people in proximity. You know, we go to the grocery store, we, we go to the coffee shop, we go to our places of work, and we're in proximity to people. And everybody has a different range of desire for community. There's some people that you're around, they want to be your friend. Some people you're around, they don't want to be your friend. Some people you're around, you want to be their friend. Some people you're around, you don't want to be their friend. And this would be a really bad time for eye contact right now, okay? <laughs> but there, there oftentimes is a mitch, mismatch in desire in community or re relationship. And awareness of what's happening in the relationship is so helpful. So what I want to be aware of is I want to be aware of the desire of the person that I'm building a friendship with, their desires, and I want to be aware of my desires, so I want to be aware of what they want in the relationship. This is important. This is worth writing down. You cannot give somebody something that they don't want. So the way friendship works is friendship is like an open hand. And if you're trying to build a friendship with somebody whose hand is closed, it's a little bit awkward to try to peel their hand open to get them to be our friend. So what I want to be aware of is does this person really want friendship? Do they have capacity for friendship? Are they at a season of life where, where friendship is the thing that is missing in their life? But that simple awareness will allow us so much, it will spare us so much heartache in building friendships in our lives. Another great way to assess desire is simply in the friendships that you're in, to, to, in tr with questions and even just to get into what is it that you want out of this relationship? What are your desires? This is so good in marriage as well, to say, you know, to your spouse, what, what is it that you're, 
you hope will come out of our marriage? Where do you want to be five years from now, ten years from now? And in parenting, one of the things I have discovered, kids go through different seasons of desire for friendship. And one of my primary goals as a dad is just simply to be in close enough friendship with them that when they get through high school, they still want to be my friend. Because this is the season for them where they are like, they are all about friendships. Students, I know you, you are all about your friendships at school. And sometimes parents are trying so hard to be cool with their kids and be their best friend. And that season, that, that'll come later in life. But in this season, it's like, okay, their desire for friendship is different than my desire. So I just need to be cool. And they'll come around at some point. At some point, they'll realize how cool I am. And they'll want to be my friend again. I'm believing it by faith. So, But what I want to do is follow Jesus' model for how Jesus assessed people's desire for friendship. To assess desire for friendship. And that awareness, what it does, is it allows me to be much more intentional in how I go about building that friendship. Now, it's important. I want you to write this down in your notes. Transaction does not equal friendship. Transactional communication is different than friendship. And the problem with our thinking oftentimes around friendship is that we commingle transaction and friendship. So this is not so much the case in Southern California, but where Stacy and I lived for 14 years in the San Francisco Bay Area, tech companies were notorious for putting ping pong tables at their place of work having breakfast, lunch, and dinner, all three meals at your work. You could go there. You might think of companies right now that do this. And you could go work there, and they would say, come find your community at your place of work. The only problem with that is if you don't do your job, you lose all your friends. Like, that's problematic. Like, we're, we're your friends as long as you perform. And inherent in that mindset is the commingling of transaction and friendship. Now, it's not that there's not transaction in friendship or relationship, but it's very important to separate out, even to have a kind of intellectual integrity in our minds about transaction. If, if you need something from me, just say, I need something from you, but don't disguise that as friendship. Because what happens is we deceive one another and maybe one person has expectation of friendship and the other person is just trying to get something from that person and just let it be what it is and have an awareness of, okay, there are times where I am building friendships with people that I have transactions with, but I want to be honest about that. And our culture is so transactional. You give me what I need, I give you what I need. It's interesting even now how intimacy is confused. Like people go on apps and they hook up with one another to quote unquote meet one another's needs on a Friday night. Totally missing the reality that intimacy was designed by God in the context of marriage between a man and a woman that is a covenantal relationship and what that covenant does is it forces a kind of commitment that it's not simply a transaction, it's a relationship that you're covenanted together through thick and thin, no matter how hard it is, for sickness, for better, for, for worse, that you are in a relationship that is not transactional, it's covenantal. And this is so important because those kinds of relationships, they form us, they shape us. So if my relationship or my community is only based upon what you can do for me, and then you don't do for me what I want from you, then I'm never formed into the image of Jesus. Jesus would form relationships with people, and he would commit himself to us to the point of death, to dying on a cross for the sins of the world. That's the example of relationship that Jesus is giving to us. And what I'm encouraging us to do is to separate out transaction from relationship. And to understand that relationship involves a significant level of commitment. Now, one of the best ways to form commitment is to start where you are. To start in the relationships that we're in. And I can think of no better way to begin this process than to be connected into a small group. Because what happens in a small group is that you get in proximity around people who say, I, I want friendship, I want community, 
I, I want to do life with some other people. I'm isolated. I need some people to support me. And what our team is doing right now is we've worked so hard to put together some resources to help us all journey together in community in small groups. And actually, this book called Rediscovering the Lost Art of Friendship, our Saddleback team wrote this book in connection with the messages. And each week as we go through a different part of friendship, this book will journey together with the messages. And the way to get into this is to be a part of a small group. Now, all of our campuses this weekend are launching literally dozens and dozens of small groups, some hundreds of small groups. And I wanna encourage you, if you're not connected into community in a small group, that you can take that step this weekend to get in a small group. All of our campuses on the patio at the Connection Center, they have resources, uh, all that you need to get connected into a small group. You can also get this book online. You can order it if you just search it on Amazon, but not while I'm speaking or preaching, get it later. But this book, you can journey together in a small group. You can take the step to get in a small group. Some of you, maybe you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about being in a group with people I don't know. You can start and host your own small group. Just pull together one to two friends. If you have a heart for people, if you can open your home, if you can just serve a snack and talk, you can host a group. And you can take that step this weekend. And it's a part of intentionality it's a part of really taking a step to get connected into community. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But what happens when I am aware is that awareness in relationship personally helps me start to come to grips with my limitations. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. The more aware I am of my surroundings and my relationships, the more I come to grips with the fact that I am limited in my ability to build friendships. I'm limited in the number of friendships that I can actually have. And Jesus, you would think, God in human flesh would have had a limitless number of friendships while he was here. But Jesus, when God came to us, he was selective. He chose a few that he would invest his life deeply in. And that's the last part I wanna finish with, is to be selective. Now this might seem so unkind to say, I'm gonna be selective in my friendships, but because of our limitations as humans, we cannot have hundreds and hundreds of friends. A connection online is not the same as friendship. Friendship is where we literally do life together, and Jesus modeled for us different numbers of people. In fact, in Luke 10, verse one, I want you to look at these verses with me. It says, after this, the Lord, talking of Jesus, appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. So Jesus, when he was here on planet Earth, he had 72 people that he sent them into ministry. But in addition to the 72, behind that was a group of 12. And notice the difference. Now, he sent 72, but with the 12, it was different. He appointed 12. Now, notice the 12. He appointed the 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So he sent them out, but he did life with them in a way that was different than the 72. So Jesus had a smaller group of people, a 12, that he did life with, and then he would send them out to preach. And then in Mark 14, I want briefly just to look at this moment where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is facing the cross knowing that he's gonna die for the sins of the world. He's begging his heavenly Father, if there's any other way, to let this cup of suffering pass, let it be so. And as he's praying this, notice in Mark 14, he took with him Peter, James, and John, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled, and he said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, and he said to them, stay here and keep watch. See, Jesus loved the crowds, but he chose a few close friends to bear his soul to. Jesus had Peter, James, and John. He wasn't telling the 72 I'm overwhelmed to the point of death. He had three friends that he did life with at a deeper level. And if Jesus relied upon people when he was here, it's so fascinating to think about God in human flesh still relying on Peter, James, and John in his moment of deep need. And what Jesus so beautifully did was as he was fully God, he was also fully man. 
And somehow he embraced his humanity within his divinity. And you and I, we're, we, we're, we're not gods. I don't know if you know that or not. We, we're, we are fully human, but we are not fully God. And we are limited in our humanity, and we can lean into this invitation. And the model of Jesus, he so beautifully shows us that you can embrace your relational limitations. And your embracing of your relational limitations is an act of love. Now, it's, it's so crazy to think about, even in coming to Saddleback over the last year, Stacy and I have wanted so much, like we came and we wanna pour out our lives and we wanna get to know people and one of the things that we just come face to face with is like we are limited human beings and our desire for friendship is often greater than our capacity for it. So we can love the 72, we can have 12, but then like there are probably about three people for all of us that we can do life deeply with. And what Jesus is modeling in this doing life together with a few small friends is he's actually deeply investing in a group of people that would carry forth this message of loving the world. And now he invites us into that same model to find a few friends that we deeply do life with and confidants that we can rely upon, that are trustworthy, that those kind of friends can walk through the thickness and the difficulty of pain and sorrow in this world. And I wonder if you have those few friends that you can do life with. You know, for all of us, there's this longing for that kind of community, and there's a temptation based upon your season of life, based upon your experience relationally and your personality, to drift to one place or the next. And for an extrovert, like the temptation is to have a thousand shallow friendships and to not have a few deep friendships. The temptation for an introvert is to be like, me and my dog are enough. Me, my dog, and Jesus, that's all I need. And there's a balance in this, there's a tension in it is to say we all, extroverts, introverts, no matter what our season of life is, we need people that we can do life with deeply. Now, I'll be honest with you, th this is hard for me personally. You know, when I reflect back on this last year, Stacy and I, we've had a group of friends that we've done life with for over a decade. And when we did ministry there in the Bay Area, there were four families. We would get together once a month and our kids knew each other and we had so many memories, holidays together, and one of the greatest sadness for us in the move here is that those friendships, they'll never be the same again. And there was a moment in May where we had a group of friends over, we celebrated our 20th anniversary, and they were all our new friends. And there were about 50 of our new friends that joined together. And I was so grateful, like at the end of that party, I looked around at the faces and I'm like, so grateful for these friends that we've known for a year. It's awesome. But as we laid in bed that night, Stacy and I were both, there was a grief for us of like the fact that there were these friendships that were in our lives for over a decade and now they're gone. And again, this is like, nobody needs to come up. Somebody said to me afterwards, I'm praying for a friend for you, Pastor. <laughs> praying for a friend. And the reason I share this with you is because I, I can relate to the struggle of there's so much brokenness in our world, there's so much busyness in our lives, like the, the, the tension is, you know, even in this season of life with teenagers and driving, kids everywhere, and it's hard to build friendships. And it takes time. It takes time, it takes intentionality. Sometimes you try and it doesn't work, I'm sure there are some of you, you got in a small group and it was like, you got in the weird small group, man. It was like, everybody was weird. And then for the guy that got in a group and nobody was weird, he was weird. And so everything, you know, sometimes everything in, in life, it, it just feels so much harder than we, we want it to. And you try for friendship and maybe you, you got burned and you... You, you lost a marriage or a, a friendship with it. Even your children feel strained or perhaps at your place of work or school, there's so much brokenness. And I just wanna say to you, I, I know it's hard. I know that friendship is one of the greatest 
sources of grief in the human experience. But what pushes me forward and what calls me into the future when it comes to friendship is I, I know there's a day at my 40th anniversary where there will be another group of friends that I've been able to do life with for the last 20 years. And it's worth it. it it's worth the sadness. It's, it's, it's worth the loss and the pain to experience the richness of life together. That's, that's what God made you for. God made you and formed you for community. And that deep intimacy that exists inside of community together when you can trust people and you can be vulnerable and honest about your struggles and you have somebody to pick you up when you're lonely and when life is going long and you're in your 80s and 90s, there's still somebody you can play pickleball with. And, and, and it's, it's worth it. It's worth it. Jesus, the Son of God, stepped down from the glory of heaven to be our friend. In 1 John chapter 4, the, the one that he called himself, John, he said the one who Jesus loved, the disciple that Jesus loved, apparently more than any other, would write about his experience with Jesus and he would say this. He would say, dear, what does he say? Dear friends at all of our campuses. What does he say? He says, dear friends. And he says this, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God, and anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. But God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him, and this is real love. Not that we love God, but he loved us, and he sent his son is a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other, befriend one another. And the invitation is into this tribe, this family called the church, that we get to do life together, that that sense of desire for belonging that's inside of you, the family of God is the place where you get to discover that, that broken and hurting and lonely people can come home and find hope and have a family that loves them and cares for them and prays for them in their times of need. Don't you want that? Don't you deep inside your soul long for that kind of community? It's because you were made by God for community to belong. And I wanna encourage you, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the sorrow, the loss, the grief, even people that you miss that are gone, and the brokenness, is to persevere, to hang in there, and to say, God, it's, it's worth it. And you know, the image of heaven that we have is not just like this empty place that we go and it's just us and God. The image of heaven is a place where community, the perfect community that God designed us for, will exist for all eternity. But in the brokenness, in the pain of this world, we get to experience just a taste of that richness, a foretaste of glory divine of what we'll get to experience for all eternity. And there are moments that you experience it. There are moments where you're having a cup of coffee, bearing your soul with a friend and they pray over you. Or there are moments when you're with a child and you look into their eyes and you think, oh, this is so rich. Or you're with a spouse. Or you're in a small group and you're praying for each other. You were made to belong. You were made to be a part of a family. And you will never be truly satisfied until you come home to be a part of a family, the family of God. And so if there's nothing else you do today, I wanna invite you to take this step to get into a small group because there's something that happens in circles that doesn't happen in rows. There's something that happens in a small group of community of people together that's not gonna happen in a worship service. We love worship services at Saddleback. We love to sing, we love the messages, at least I do. And we, we love to be together in large groups, but it's in a small group when we're committed to each other that we experience the depth 
of life change that God wants us to have and the richness of community that God designed us for. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you've designed us to be a part of a family. And God, I know that there are people that have come to listen to this message at all of our campuses. They drove in a car by themselves and they are so lonely right now. And God, they're right next to some of their very best future friends. And I pray that today would be a day of courage, that just somebody would step out and say, I don't, I don't wanna do life alone anymore. I, I need family, I need friends. I need that, that honest acknowledgement that we need support. And God, I pray that you would help us be a representation of the kind of community that it, a taste of heaven. Jesus, you said to pray you said, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And God, I pray that your kingdom would come at Saddleback Church, that his eyes lock on patios and hugs happen and people sit in circles together, that that richness of community that is so different in the family of God that we would experience, and even lost sons and daughters would come home that as they get a, t a taste of that kind of community, that we would experience it, that we would be bold to step into community, to come into small groups today. God, thank you that you made us for family. Thank you that you are an eternal God that has existed in this eternal community, and now you invite us as sons and daughters into it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.